And this is not to incite people. This is not to say that this is the clash of the civilizations, as put by Samuel Huntington. But this is the reality that we cannot escape. This is the reality on the ground. The common denominator every single time is first Iraq, first Afghanistan, then Iraq, then by proxy to Lebanon, then Somalia. Where's it going to end? And now, of course, Pakistan with the aerial and drone attacks and the uh, targeted assassinations. It is extremely important, brothers and sisters, that we start getting active. We start getting active in the way, not simply by doing demonstrations and doing collections. The best activity that you can do, remember the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba as in their youth, they learned several arts. And a lot of them we talk about in, 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 a, in a sense of uh, um, encouraging one another to do, to do actions and so forth. The Sahaba used to be taught archery and horsemanship and swordmanship and so forth. But one thing we often forget is that they were taught how to speak. They were taught balagha. They were taught how to articulate themselves. And the battle that's taking place right now in the media against the Muslims is clear and for you, for everybody to see. You can even see it with an attack on Afia Siddiqui just last week in one of the main newspapers here in the UK. And the difference is this. We have not got enough, in enough, a strong enough body of people to make the response, even though we have a massive number of people in this country. We should be the experts commentating, speaking, writing on issues pertaining to us in the media. And if we don't, somebody else will do it. And that is what's happening thus far. And that is why the onslaught against us seems as if we're just on the, backing, on the back foot and we're the victims. I don't know any brother who came out from Guantanamo who would like to tell you he's a victim. He'd tell you he's a survivor and tell you that he's got strength that you can't imagine. You can't imagine where he got that strength from. Allah subhanahu wa says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلُهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ Whoever fears Allah, Allah will make for him what? A way out, a makhraj. Imagine what that is to a prisoner when he reads this ayah. وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ and he will provide for him from whence he never imagined. And this should be the same for us. We should be strong. We should be articulate. We should be like the Prophet ﷺ when he taught Zayd ibn, he sent as an order Zayd ibn Thabit that the Yahud are the ones who are writing all our missives, all our letters, because we have got amongst us people who are ummeen, people who are illiterate. And we cannot be, afford to be in a state like this. So he ordered him to go and learn Hebrew and the language of the Assyrian in order that the Muslims don't become reliant on others for their communications. And in the same way, brothers and sisters, we find that people are our advocates. We'll find all sorts of human rights organizations are our advocates. All sorts of groups are our advocates, and we welcome that. But surely, you must be your own best advocate. Surely, you must be the one who can tell your story the best. Why this fear? Why this lethargy? We've lost confidence. We haven't got the confidence to stand up in front of people, say what we are, who we are, what we believe and what we think, and to say it in a manner that makes sense and is reasonable. Because once we can start doing this, brothers and sisters, that is when we are doing not only the work of protecting ourselves, but carrying forward the da'wah. The Prophet ﷺ said, anni walaw ayah. Teach of me, even if it's just one verse. And the verse shouldn't be projected to people in a me method of anger that makes no sense. The Prophet ﷺ never used to speak like this. The Allah subhanahu wa says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika. That's invite to the way of Allah with wisdom and kind words and argue with them within that which is best. So we, can, we have a fight in front of us, brothers and sisters. We have a lot of people to advocate for. And I tell you this from working on the cases of caged prisoners that I do almost every day. That there are sisters who have not seen their husbands for eight years. 
There are children who have never seen their fathers. Never. Eight-year-old children who have never seen their fathers because they are in a prison, in a secret prison, where they, or a Guantanamo, where they have never been charged with a crime, they have never been tried with a crime, they have not been found guilty of any crime. So who are the criminals? Americans or us? Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu la ila illa anta astaghfiruhu wa atubu ilayk. Now, um, I'll put the footage over to you. Are there any questions um, for tonight? Uh, if you could just speak up a little bit. You mentioned the Americans are trying to sweep um, the fact that the sister was in prison. Yeah. What about you think they were, they were worried about that? Um, I mean, they're so concerned to hide it. The brother asked a question, uh, which was that uh, I suggested that the Americans are trying to sweep uh, the fact that Afia was uh, in prison under the carpet. Uh, the reason why I've come to this conclusion, brother, is because it is not just about Afia. What is really important to understand is because Afia, of who she is, first of all, she's a woman, she's a Muslim woman. Secondly, what we do know is from Iraq, uh, there's been a decision given not to allow the publication of photographs of the violation of people there, which includes women. And they have said this quite clearly because it would uh, affect the effort, the war effort in Iraq and, and these places. So, if that is the case with Iraq, uh, and I'm certainly aware that there are some horrific pictures that I don't think anybody would want to to see of sisters being violated in Iraq, then whatever it is that happened to Afia, and I'm not suggesting she was violated, but whatever it is that happened to Afia, they would like to cover up. Based upon the evidence we have had, and it is not conclusive, but there are so many factors, and it doesn't just include non-Muslims uh, Muslims who've said it. There are at least three reliable Muslims who've said that they have seen her. There is also uh, the people from the Red Cross who've said that they have seen Prisoner 650. Uh, we believe that Prisoner 650 was a woman and she definitely was in Bagram. What the Americans contest and say is that Prisoner 650 was not Afia Sabidi. However, Based upon the evidence that we've had a look at so far, and it is not conclusive, I agree, uh, we believe that Afia Siddiqui may well be Prisoner 650, and if that is the case, the United States of America don't want people to know that. Yes, bro. Um, has Sister Afia been charged? And uh, if she hasn't been charged, is that not then bad against the law? Uh, it's an extremely, uh, very important question. Um, yes, the question was that uh, uh, has Sister Afia been charged with a crime? And if she hasn't been charged, then surely her detention is not right. That's correct. But she has been charged with a crime. Let me explain to you how and why and how ludicrous it is. She was charged with the attempted murder of, American, of an American soldier. That's what she's been charged with. <clears throat> However, she'd been put on a, a, a wanted list prior to her detention in 2003. And they believed she had some kind of a link with terrorists alleged terrorists. And bizarrely, all of these years that she's been disappeared, they did not charge her with anything. They only said they wanted her for questioning and they said actually that she's not, she's not done anything. Nonetheless, when they did arrest her, or they did take her from outside of the house of the governor of Ghazni, that's where she was detained with her, hus with her, daughter, with her son, Ali Ahmed. And there, the Americans claim, and this is, the, this is the, the thing that I simply will not believe, that Afia, all I think five foot two or five foot three of her, a very petite, small woman, managed somehow to grab an American weapon, an M16, chamber a round, because you don't walk around with a gun and the round is chambered, and then fire off two rounds, aim the gun and fire off two rounds at the American and miss him at, from a point-blank range. The American, being of course an American, took out his sidearm, shot, shot back at Afia and hit her twice. 
That's what the Americans said happened. So as a result of this, Afia has been charged with attempted murder. Now, the bizarre thing about this, brothers, is I can tell you, many a time, many a time, I have wanted to try to get hold of an American weapon. Many a time. And I tell you something else. I am short, but I can do press-ups on two fingers, on the backs of my hands, in handstand position, and I'm, I think I could give lots of people a really easy, hard go on, on an arm wrestle and a fight. But I never got the opportunity to grab a weapon from an American soldier. And there are brothers much tougher than me in Guantanamo and Bagram and the other places and Abu Ghraib and all the other places who, if they would have got the opportunity, they would have killed somebody with their bare hands. But they couldn't and they didn't. And there are no recorded events of that ever happening. And yet Afia Siddiqui has managed to do so. Bizarre. So I don't believe it, I'm not buying it. And then Sister Yvonne also went to the house of the, to the, to the uh, um, place where this alleged shooting took place. And the story that was told to her by the chief of police over there and the governor of, of Ghazni is entirely in contradiction to what the Americans have said. They say that Afia didn't shoot anybody or didn't even attempt to do so. But are they going to use the testimony of these guys in court in America? I, I, I admit this much, that the case of Afia Siddiqui has got lots and lots of things that we don't know about. There are things that trouble me that we still don't know about. But until we hear them from her, then we'll never know completely. And one of the things that's happening now is because she's getting all these strip searches, um, she refuses to see anybody. And inshallah, that has now begun to change. So I pray that, uh, that the, the letter writing campaign, the postcard campaign, will help to make that a reality where she doesn't get strip searched at all. Inshallah. Any other, any other questions? Any, anyone? <coughs> tonight? A anything that Morrison has said or anything that Yvonne has said earlier? It might be not irrelevant. Since my childhood, I cannot understand the how come the human being oppress other human beings. I cannot. And, and, and the West, they say they are the champion of human rights. So why they bring to us? Why? I cannot understand. Uh, the brother has asked me a question that I don't think I know definitely anybody can answer for sure. And that is, why is it that humans oppress humans, and why is it in particular they are oppressing us now, when they claim to be the champions and the bastions of human rights and, and so forth? Well, I can say this much, there's no angels around. A lot of us come from countries, and perhaps not here in this audience, but I know audiences where there are people who have escaped their countries. Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Libya, the list is endless. They escaped those countries to come over here so they could be living in a place where they've got some human rights. The bizarre part of it now is, of course, <laughs> some of those brothers are in detention in this country without charge or trial. Some of them were detained for such a long time that they chose, they opted to return to that very country where they sought ref refuge from in the knowledge that they would get tortured rather than sit here in limbo in the land of human rights and dignity. Now, before we get sort of carried away, Britain still is, in my estimation, a lot better than those places. And up until we have a working example as Muslims of a country that respects the dignity of people, that respects the dignity of Muslims and other people, the way that the Sahaba did and the Prophet ﷺ did, until we're able to establish a place like that, it's going to be very difficult for us to say, here's an example we can give you. The only examples we can give you are the dungeons of Egypt and of Limantora prison of Morocco and of Pakistan, where they sell people for a fee and torture them. We have come to accept Britain as a place that it, you have rights and so forth. And the torture that's happening, brother, is because of the dehumanization process. That process begins from ignorance. That ignorance, we are to a degree also have a responsibility in stopping because if people are ignorant about our faith, why, why are they ignorant?